Um, everybody, this is Brandon Carlson, a uh, friend of the family. Uh, he's going to give us a nice talk today. We appreciate him taking time. It's a little later in the day for him, so I don't want him to have to delay his day any more than than he has already. So without further ado, Brandon from University of Kansas, hit it. Yeah, sounds good. Thank you so much. It's truly uh, an honor once again to to speak to this group. I think your um, your foundation is uh, phenomenal. Clearly has un unprecedented or unparalleled leadership, and the fact that you put on these uh, these conferences for a lot of people around the world is is really fun. And I'm just uh, an honor to be a part of that. So uh, they asked me today to talk about robotics in spine surgery. I'm going to go ahead and share my PowerPoint here. Got too many things open. It's working. All right. You guys can see it OK? Yes, sir. All right, let me go ahead and get it started here. Um, so I, I gave this talk recently, actually, and I left this slide as it was uh, and and I kind of updated it for for today. But, you know, the the title that was asked of me today was robotics and spine surgery and so i i updated my title slide but then this is how i actually titled it before i said how robotic assistants can make spine surgery safer and easier and i gave this talk in in dubai to an ao group uh, i do have relevant disclosures here i i give consulting uh or i do consulting for for globus and it's mainly uh speaking and teaching about robotics and then i also have ownership in a company that's out of france that that is developing robotic technology so those are definitely relevant and you'll see sort of some of the bias in in elements of my talk that are related to globus but i try to keep it balanced so i have a comprehensive practice i do pretty much anything that walks in the door i'm at an academic center and i use this robot now three to seven times per week if not sometimes more but I don't use it on every case, and I'm very specific about that. And and it's it's become a tool in my toolbox. But I I'll talk to you a little bit about where I find it has areas to shine. I didn't have any training in in on robotics. We didn't have any robots. They were getting a, a pretty popular when I was in fellowship. So I never saw this before I started my practice. Uh, so the outline of this talk's a little bit. I'm going to give you kind of a crash course. I don't know everyone's. You know, the audience here could be a wide variety, and some people might not fully understand how a robot fits into this spine surgery realm. And then I'm going to talk to you about how it's a surgical tool, but it's not really a surgeon. And then to give you some examples here of, of things I've found it to be very useful for, good data review or at least some data review to to kind of top things off, make it academic as is possible, and then some tips and and pearls at the end. So I, I want to clear the air. Is is Hani on? I didn't hear him speak up earlier, but I want to clear the air that uh, a couple of years ago I was at Base to Summit giving a talk on robotic spine surgery and was pretty excited about it and and thought it went well. And Hani comes up to the mic and and he's the only one that asked me a question. He says, "Listen, Brandon, I I just don't get it. Aren't robots just navigation?" And I said, and at the time I kind of stumbled and answered poorly, but I think my new answer would be this: Yes. It is no navigation, but it's navigation with less variation, more imaging options, more pre-planning features, and it's just easier. And I think the just easier part is why people, once they start using it, they seem to adopt it and they don't get away from it too too far. Oh, hold on. There we go. Uh, so the crash course part. So stereotaxis and stereotactic surgery uh, dates back quite a while. In fact, some of the first reports of stereotactic surgery are from the early 1900s but when ct became available ct based stereotactic surgery was first described in the late 80s and then the first uh, navigated uh, stereotactic surgery for the brain was done in 87 in japan and now if you go into the neurosurgery realm and you've got some neurosurgeons on this on this on this call this is standard of care I mean, it's widely considered, you know, you have to use this when you're doing brain tumor surgery now, and that's 2023. So that's real, real time, you know, uh, changes. When we look at robotics and spine surgery, or, or really, if you look at something else that could have a parallel, uh, spine instrumentation developments were huge, but there was a huge push, you know, prior to the Harrington rod, which really dated back to the 60s uh, into the mid 80s. It wasn't anything. So for 20 years, you just had Harrington rods. And then in the 80s, there was a huge boom in instrumentation of the spine. 
and the CDI instrumentation became popular. I sold them, followed after that. And then that's when pedicle screw fixation became sort of talked about and tried and then became mainstay. And in the 1990s, polyaxial screws with uh, Puno and his group became available. And, and now current day instrumentation is all based on these same principles. So 2023, we all just have new colors, different designs, different connectors, locking mechanisms, tulips, et cetera. So on this right side, you see the robotic developments are much, much more recent. So in 2004, the first FDA approval for a spinal uh, a, a spine assist robot by Mazor Robotics. In 2011, they came out with Renaissance, which if anyone is familiar, it, it didn't have a huge following or, or a huge uh, popularity because of some of the fallbacks of it. But in 2016, you see that big gap there, Medtronic bought Mazor Robotics and then they developed Mazor X and that was a huge push forward. Same year, Rosa Spine, which was a, another robot repurposed from using it for um, stereotactic brain operations, was repurposed into the spine world as well. And then in 2017, Ro uh, Glo Globus bought a, a small company and, and implemented Globus Excelsis GPS uh, publicly or onto the market. And 2019, there was an update to Mazor, which included navigation platform on top of it. So really, if you look... I mean, back in the 70s, we were still struggling to develop good instrumentation. But when you think about robotics, this isn't this is all recent stuff. I mean, we're we're not even 10, 20 years in yet, and, and we're seeing big developments and big changes happen quickly. But if you really look at look at sort of worldwide market share, these two are the ones that, in my opinion, there, there's a couple others out there that I don't have on this slide, and, and I'm not trying to be comprehensive, but these are the ones that have the most market share uh, by far, uh, without a doubt. But what's really important for everyone to understand is the robot is not like what you see in this middle picture. It's not like iRobot, that movie with Will Smith, where it's an autonomous thing that's thinking and doing things on its own. And it's definitely not a surgeon. Like this, the way I talk about this is it's a cobot. And so back to Hani's comment, yes, it's just navigation, but it's better navigation. And so if we think of it as navigation and we think of it as a surgical tool, we'll think about all the other surgical tools we have in our operating room, right? From the top left, they're the most simple tools which are just clamps and things that were developed, have all sorts of names to them, right? 30, 40, 50 years ago, they didn't have those. Now we have power tools to make cutting bones and doing total joints easier. We've got ports and, and our, all sorts of uh, laparoscopic type things, which those are huge developments to make surgery smarter, faster, easier with less invasion. We've got special tables for people. You've got arthroscopy stuff in the orthopedic world that makes getting into a joint and visualization better. And then this is an IR procedure. I mean, they didn't have really good IR procedures until the advent of, of common day or, or, or modern day imaging and, and sort of the ways to cannulate vessels. And now all of a sudden that's the, the standard of care. So if you think about a spine surgery, the tools we use in spine surgery, you've got this long list here and there's all sorts of phases of the surgery that I've kind of listed out here. And we have special retractors, we use cell savers, we use probes and feelers for placing implants, osteotomes, curettes, box cutters. Surgeons get really creative with how to use different instruments in different ways. But where navigation of robotics really fall is just into the implant realm currently. I mean, there's talks about trying to make it do more things and have ways to make surgeons safer in different areas, but currently it helps you put implants in. And we all are, we all acknowledge that and recognize that, and that's that's okay. So if we think about the other surgical tools we use to place implants, well, the most basic would be what we call a lanky probe or a pedicle probe. And certainly that when that was developed, it created a different type of instrument that had a little bit more safety margin and was still surgeon driven or surgeon used to place implants through the spine. Navigation came along before robotic assistance, and you can see that here. It's still surgeon driven, surgeon held. Many people on this call are familiar with that, but it helps you visualize the spine in three dimensions uh, with real time imaging and, and place implants. And then robotic assistance is a step beyond that, where there's a arm that assists somebody and you can see me there placing a screw with my arms going across the bed and i know greg mundus is notorious for placing screws on both sides but i don't think a lot I'm, well i don't do that uh, i think that a lot of surgeons feel most comfortable on the side that they're on uh, but the robot makes it super easy you're you're visualizing the instrumentation you're visualizing the implants as they go in with a pre-planned trajectory and a rigid robotic arm that assists you so what what is it really? I mean, it's this tracking. It's that's navigation, right? You have trackers on the patient. You have a camera in the room. You have imaging and calibration. So there's a lot of different ways to obtain imaging in the operating room. We're familiar with intraoperative 3D, 3D, which that's most navigation platforms, if not all of them at this point, with the exception of one that I know of, uses intraoperative 3D. So those on the bottom there are two examples. 
that's the O-Arm on the left, and that's Azeem. There's several other brands. I'm not trying to be comprehensive, but those obtain a cone beam CT in the operating room, which is real-time uh, ground truth imaging, if you will, and that calibrates to a, a computer system or a navigation platform that shows you those images uh, in conjunction with tracking the instruments. Now, what's different with most robotic platforms, especially Globus and Medtronic, is they have this pre-op CT merge. The way this works is you take a CT scan of the patient preoperatively, you load it into the system, you pre-plane your screws, and then this is what it looks like. You've got this we call it a tambourine. Some people call it the birthday cake. This uh, fiducial array is attached to a regular C-arm. This is a regular GE 9900 C-arm, and you get these black dots on the image. And through that calibration system, and there's tracking balls on this array, you get this, and this is a what, what the merge looks like. I'm going to do a case today with the robot, and this is what I'll look at. That That screen without the dots, or that picture without the dots, is the uh, interpretation of the preoperative CT, and then the one with the dots is the image I took intraoperatively, and the algorithm in the computer, the robot, merges those two together to give me real-time imaging. With two fluoro shots, it gives me navigation. And so this is the pre-planning part. There's a screen, and you can see your preoperative CT here on the left. It's already on the screen, and then you plane your screws where you want them to end up, and then really the, uh, the workhorse of it is after you've done that, after you've got your imaging capture, you execute the screws. The execution of the screws is the easy part. Rigid robotic arm is the guide. It decreases your instrument variability. There's tracking of the arm. There's tracking of your instruments. It just makes things a little bit faster without radiation. And so here's what it would look like. Uh, granted, the person on the right is a chief resident. He's a fifth year. He's going into spine. He's going to do his Leatherman. He's going to do his fellowship at Leatherman. So I do think of him as a skilled surgeon. But is he an attending who's done hundreds and hundreds of navigation cases? No. Uh, that's me on the left doing a robot screw. So all the steps that I'm including are the same on both. So he's using brain lab navigation on the right side. And right now he's tapping. And I just did a burr. Now I'm doing a tap on the left. And then I'm going to place a screw. And this is to try to show that he's, you know, watching this screen and you can see his instrument has variation. It's moving a little bit, which is fine. He's still going to execute and and achieve the same the same result potentially. But in the same amount of time or maybe less time, I'm already putting the screw in. He's now getting his screw in his hand. You can see that my screen never moved. His screen's moving all over the place and I'm done and moving on to my next screw. Um, so again, that's just a small example. I'm planning to refilm this with myself on a brain lab to make it a little more of a fair comparison, but um, you can see that they're very similar. They have the similar navigation. The screen looks very similar. You know, he's using the screen to, to adjust his movements, uh, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> so it does have some built-in safety measures. I think that's worth telling you about. When you are at the right height and the right trajectory, you get these green boxes around the screen. This offset meter shows you if anything's moving, meaning the patient, the camera, anything that's moving in the in the field. When patients have high respiration or high tidal volumes on the on the um, um, ventilator, this will move a lot, and that's a an error thing that pa uh, patients, I'm sorry, surgeons need to watch for. This is tracking the patient, this is tracking your tool, and then there's this surveillance marker. This little ball here, at least in this platform, tells you whether this moved or not. And all navigation systems have the same flaw. They rely on one, one point in space that's attached to the patient with one array, and we don't have anything really to tell us if that thing moved, but this system does. So that surveillance marker, you tell it at the beginning, this is where the array is sitting, and if anything moves, the surveillance marker of that array this will go to the red, and then that would be an alert that you're not accurate anymore. Uh, so that, again, highlights those, those uh, elements. Um, so where is this useful? I found MIS percutaneous screws. There's a lot of different ways you can do those, obviously, but I think you need image guidance for any one of them uh, in current day spine surgery. So fluoro, nav, or robot. The robot, after image acquisition, there's no radiation, which I love about that. So I don't wear lead for these cases, and it's a repetitive workflow. Uh, you obviously have the same benefits for MIS uh, as you would talk about in any scenario. These are examples. Uh, you know, I used this example once in giving a talk uh, where Hanjo was involved because Hanjo's always harped on, well, it takes forever. You know, it's, it's uh, all these papers they report. It takes you 12 minutes a screw or nine minutes a screw. And it's not reality. Like that includes exposure. Uh, I'm sorry, that includes all the setup. That includes the workflow, the setup of attaching the array on the patient. 
and then image acquisition and then implementing screws or executing screws. Executing screws takes about 30 to 45 seconds. The workflow takes a long takes longer and that's what you got to get good at. But I tell him, how can you look at the spine and through a three centimeter incision obtain these types of screws? And that's where I think that, you know, any MIS surgeon would would have a similar argument. Other other areas where I found this to be useful instrumenting a previous fusion mass. There's no bony landmarks. Maybe it's a scoliosis patient with dysplastic pedicles, et cetera. This is a great example of that. So this is a patient at a previous Harrington instrumentation. Uh, we mapped her spine with a preoperative CT scan. You can see the pedicles are very small. You can see the fusion mass is, is uh, smooth through here. So there's no actual landmarks uh, when you open up the spine. This was done as an open procedure. Here's another example. This is a small pedicle, very sclerotic and dysplastic in a spondylolisthesis patient. And these are sometimes hard to cannulate, uh, but with navigation and with a drill, you can go right through the, the area of interest. If you had just a, a freehand pedicle feeler, you might uh, go into the wrong uh, area because of the sclerotic bone. Here's another example. This is a fusion mass. This is a patient I did. Uh, you can see this is at the apex of her curve. Uh, there's a lot of rotation here, that rotational anatomy. Uh, creates dysplasia through that pedicle. It's a very small pedicle. You can see the cord. This is a myelogram, obviously, is is right up next to that. So this is uh, another great example with a couple fluoro shots. You're going to get accurate navigation and go through the proper area the first time. Other examples that I found it to be very useful is iliac fixation or S2AI screws. It only requires two fluoro shots. It's very quick. I uh, get perfect placement almost every single time on the first try. I don't have as much distal skin or fascia dissection. I pre-plan the alignment of the pedicle screws to line up with my other instrumentation, even though I freehand open uh, deformity cases from there up. It maximizes the screw length and diameter. I can get additional anchors without uh, too much trouble, and I can plan around previous hardware or line up with previous hardware if they've had, if it's a revision type surgery. Here's an example of that. So this is a woman I wanted two anchors on one side because she had a coronal imbalance. You'll see her film here in a second. And very easily I can look at this. This is all in the pre-planning screw uh, screen on the on the robot. And you can plan right in the middle of the teardrop at the at the bottom at the top and these two screws you know right up to the to the to the joint there and this is the result with two fluoro shots in 17 minutes uh, i can get three iliacs without too much difficulty without too much cognitive load not having to worry about it too much and the distal dissection is smaller i've seen uh i've seen cases where it takes them more than 15 minutes to get a fully in place so for me 17 minutes of attaching the clamp, putting in three screws, not having to worry too much and having them line up perfectly is worth it. It's it's two fluoro shots, not a lot of radiation, not a lot of fiddle factor. Uh, and we've gotten our workflow down to have it be very smooth and simple like that. This is the result. Uh, she was a previously non-instrumented fusion about 30, 40 years ago with a cast and she developed distal degeneration and, and coronal malalignment. So we, we did some inner bodies up front because of her bone health and uh, uh, just wanting additional fusion potential. This is the same patient where I instrumented the fusion mass up here with the robot. And then we did a second calibration for the iliac. So again, that's a, a just a good example of how to use this tool. Here's some other iliac examples, S2AI screws that you know, once you get your post-ops, you're very happy with how they line up. Obviously, this is a guy with a tumor. He had multiple myeloma in his sacrum. I needed four points of fixation, dissolated that in my, you know, in my practice, that's what I wanted. Uh, here's another uh, example, an MIS uh, deformity that I've done in the past. So what about the data? Uh, most papers that are out here, they, they look at navigation, they look at freehand, they look at 2D fluoro, for example, or 3D, which is navigation potential uh, or navigation platforms. And most of them show, you know, mid to high 90% accuracy of, of different parts of the spine. And, and that's pretty consistent. When you start to look at 3D nav plat, uh, platforms and papers that are on that, they show high accuracy, not 100, uh, but robot assisted seem to have the highest accuracy in this paper, for example, 97.4% um, uh, high successful, you know, with only 2.6 reposition. Again, that's with robot assisted platforms. There's a lot of papers in, improved accuracy with a robotic group fewer facet violations that's probably from the pre-planning versus the the real-time free hand again uh, accuracy of 97 percent no facet violations again accuracy 99 percent so you're seeing a lot of trends here i mean a lot of this is going to be based on surgeon accurate or surgeon uh control and surgeon uh utilization of the product and, and there's a lot of things about navigation in general that i could talk about for hours about 
you know, the, the user is in charge of the accuracy, so to speak. Uh, here's another one, decreased radiation dosage. Uh, that's a pretty important thing, in my opinion. I think a lot of us who do MIS procedures, we're worried about that long term. And another one with a lot of radiation reduction in the robotic group. Here's a bunch of other papers I pulled up just last night. Uh, this is since 2022. Again, not looking at a comprehensive literature search here, but you can see trends that are happening. Robotics and cervical spine surgery. Another paper on clinical outcomes. Surgeon well-being and ergonomics. How we're going to use it in pediatric spine surgery. Uh, the learning curves and, and how we should apply it to our residency curricula. Uh, increased pedicle screw sizes and uh, indicated by uh, elevated trigger, triggered EMG. So really high EMG levels means probably perfect screws, outcomes and complications in a five-year trend. All really, really important. Uh, I'm going to fly through this really fast because I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I think I'll get a little bit over time if I don't. But we looked at our first 101 cases. This is a few years back now. And, and just to go through it really quickly to show you what two surgeons who'd never used a robot before, what we found, um, we'd use it in the thoracic spine. You can see 34 screws here. This is a tumor procedure I did. Um, ladder or lumbar and degenerative screws, uh, mostly in the lumbar spine, mostly were PERC. We had 406 screws in 91 cases. We did 16 S2AI screws in that initial series of 101 cases. And here's what we found. We only had two screws that we aborted or removed. That's pretty good in my opinion. I think for any nav platform, uh, the accuracies are all really high if you respect the rules of navigation. One thing that I think was important also is we didn't abandon the robot ever. There's a lot of papers out there that talk about when the when the robot, uh, you have an error or something's off, the calibration's off, they just get rid of the robot and they go to freehand. Um, this is an example of a tumor case I did. This just didn't look like my plan. I didn't think that it was wrong, but it just didn't look like my plan. So I decided to take it out and the clinical uh, result wasn't any different. And so this was uh, recent, but as of 4-17-2023, at our institution, we've done 710 robot cases. I've found at least five aborted or removed screw cases with no neuro deficits and no returns to the OR for screw malposition. That's our experience at this institution. I think that there's, again, so many variables in navigation utilization that you can't capture with a lot of these types of papers. Uh, so it, it might sound biased and it might bias, but I'll just tell you that we're very, very careful with this type of technology. Here's examples. Uh, again, I'll go quickly through these. This was one of my uh, early cases, a third case. We did an O-arm spin. Uh, please ju uh, don't judge my segmental lordosis here. I was still young in my in my career, and I think I've done a, a few other things to try to get those uh, images looking better and, and hopefully give those patients longer-term good results. Here's another one, 14th case. is the first time I did a CT merge after an inner body. That's another topic that comes up a lot is if you put a metallic inner body in, does your pre-op CT, can it merge? Because it looked like this, but yes, you can. It, it does work. There's a, a really good algorithm. This is my 39th case. We were still doing O-arm spins after flipping after an A-lift. Here's an S2AI example. Um, once again, seven to nine minute total for this one with a CT merge. I'm usually around 15 minutes. It's pretty consistent for me now for, for iliacs. This is another more complicated case. I did this about a year after starting to use the robot. Uh, this is a discitis case in a young guy, 47. I, I was really trying to think about, well, could I, is there a way I could use the robot to place screws in a lateral position? Uh, and this is in a thoracic spine. And so this is what we did. I had cardiothoracic surgery help me get there. The guy had young, good bone. Once again, I did a basically partial corpectomies, took out the infected segments, put in this expandable cage. Uh, but I wanted to instrument long and fuse short in him, which was my entire goal. And by doing that, we didn't reposition him. We stayed in the lateral position. We placed these screws with two fluoro shots. And my anesthesiologist was like, wait, we're not flipping? What, what's going on? And, and so just in about 20 minutes of extra time with the same prepping and draping as we used from the start, I got the screws in. Here was his result. My goal, again, was to, once he fused, I would remove his instrumentation, which is exactly what we did. He's more than two years out now um, and, and doing quite well. So here's some other uh, more complicated cases. I did a CT merge on this after multiple metallic inner bodies. That's always a big question when I teach courses is how do you get it to merge with these inner body, you know, the, the vertebral bodies in between when everything's moved. It can be done. You just have to be careful with how you get your x-ray. And then uh, here's more single position surgery. So this is uh, uh, one thing that I never knew, never saw. I never saw, a, you know, you guys get to see Bob do these and probably Mundus. 
uh, I never saw this in fellowship, so I'd never even thought to do a instrumentation in the ladder position, but the robot helped me and it enabled me to do it. And once I planned it out and once I started looking at how you prep and drape and respecting the rules of the patient positioning, I was able to start doing these types of cases and now it's pretty routine in my practice. Here's some uh, pearls for the robot. You can use any bed you want, but you have to make sure that the metal is not in the field of your x-ray or else that CT merge won't work because it'll be blocking those balls. As you guys probably know, pulling someone back too far is where that rail gets into play. But um, the robot arm can get around that corner. It, it's not too too difficult. Uh, special draping, I usually do this. Uh, I've done a couple different changes in my draping now. Uh, not using a C-armor, I use a uh, I use uh, like a triangle uh, drape that they use in trauma or cystos uh, just to catch the blood. Here's the cases I found of my own that remove screws, small pedicles when it's the last screw after you put in a large one on the other side. There's a lot of torque that can happen when you put in large screws. And I think that I figured out when I when I think that there's a small pedicle like this, uh, this is the same, this was the similar scenario. This is an isthmic spondy with a sclerotic pedicle. And I was going for these big, long screws and these big, you know, large diameter screws. In my opinion, the torque of that rotates the vertebral body enough, just a couple millimeters to make this screw miss on the other side. So it's a lesson I've learned. And what I do now is I'll cannulate both pedicles before placing a screw. I use a, a drill and then a tap, and then I'll go back and put the screw in and start one screw and then go start the other screw. I've not had a missed screw since learning that lesson, but uh, both of these or all these scenarios, I just removed the screws in the operating room. No one had any uh, returns or clinical implications, no neurologic deficits. So why do I still use it? I think it's accurate and safe and easy. CT merge has really taken radiation out of my room substantially. I've learned a couple different ways to do single position surgery now, MIS and other traumas, tumors, S2AI. These are things that uh, have just become easier with this tool in my hands. Uh, again, it's just a tool. I think that it can be used in specific cases and not for others. I don't force it into every type of surgery. Uh, I think though there's a lot to come. Robotic platforms are not going away. They're gonna evolve and they're gonna get better. And this is just the beginning. Here's the other reasons I still use it. I get x-rays that look like this all the time. And this isn't like a, a showing off type of thing, but this is just what you expect. This is now what do I expect every every time because the planning and, and how the robot is, is super accurate. It just gets these types of x-rays. This is a case I did last week. I texted it to Bob and, uh, and to Mundus. And once again, it's just, it's, it's so consistent. I don't even have to worry about it. The, uh, the tips of the screws are almost always to the front of the vertebral body like that. Um, and it's very, very quick. I've also learned to use it uh, in a way that I can, I know when it's accurate, I know what I'm looking for. And this is a, this is a fourth year resident putting screws in, uh, certainly in a prone case, it's a little bit easier ergonomically, but look over here, he's also putting in a single position lateral screw on the bottom side. And I don't have any hesitation about that now. I know what it looks like when it's accurate and not, and I can trust that, that he's gonna be able to execute the screw steps safely. This is a tumor case I was doing. And then here's an S2AI example, just large screws that go in again, without me having to worry too much or think too much, decrease my cognitive load. Um, I think the bottom line of this uh, this slide, I can send this again to your group. I'm, I'm about to run out of, I'm a little over time, sorry, is, uh, you know, high risk screws, I, I hold respirations. I make sure that the spine doesn't move. I think the game of navigation is motion is the devil. Anything that moves or can move or how far away you are from the tracking array is why people have errors. And if you respect the rules of navigation, the robot's just another version of that. It's a surgical tool. So you have to have a good team in your room. You have to have a system in your OR for protecting yourself against the flaws of navigation in general. Um, and so what I think is going to come is there's got to be cost effectiveness analysis. Everything that anybody talks about is how expensive robots are. Well, navigation's expensive. Robots and navigation are both expensive. It's technology. It's always going to be expensive. We got to drive the cost down, but we have to show that it is worth having in your OR uh, if you want to use it. Failure scenarios. This is a huge topic that I'm focused on right now. I think this is where people, if you've heard a horror story about a robot, it's probably, um, the, it wasn't the robot's fault. I guess the robot is always right. The only thing, it's so simple. It only tracks the the balls in the, in the field. It's when the calibration is off or you're too far away from the tracking device that you have problems. So I'm working on how to teach failure scenarios similar to how pilots are trained for ser failure scenarios in the aviation industry. And, and I think that that's gonna come out soon. I've got a, a lot of my data already already pulled and I'm and I'm working on the way to, to tell that message or, or hopefully spread that message.
I think the future of navigation is going to be true real-time segmental spine tracking. That's going to change the game if we can track every vertebra in real time. There'll be more arms probably, faster calibration, smaller arms, et cetera. Navigation without ionizing radiation has also got to become part of our mainstay. Anything that we can navigate without irradiating the patient or radiating ourselves is going to be a game changer. Uh, lastly, just keep giving positive thoughts to my partner, Dr. Burton. These are all recent pictures. Our OR staff um, is, is super supportive of him. Uh, they dedicated his OR to with a plaque, and, and that was the morning of it. These are all four of us, uh, spine surgeon partners here. A uh, recent dinner with some other prominent spine surgeons. Greg came out recently, last week or two weeks ago, and uh, and had dinner with him at his house. So please just keep your positive thoughts. If you know him, give him a call. Uh, he's doing great right now, but but he that that positive energy goes a long way. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and get out of this and see if anybody has some questions. I got about I got uh, probably five minutes if you guys still do. Hey, thank you, Brandon. That was hey, awesome. Uh, yeah, thank you. Hey, quick question for you. Um, what percentage... Jamie, Jamie, it's kind of kind of quiet. Can you can everybody hear? Yes. Yeah. Am I quiet or? No, go ahead. No, yeah. I just, Brent. I want to know what percentage of cases now you're using the robot and navigation on now versus say three years ago, four years ago. What's what's the percentage change now? Yeah, uh, that's a great uh, that that's a great question. I actually have a med student who's pulling all my robotic data and also all navigated cases that are non-robotic. Um, so let me try to answer that in, a, in two ways just to be comprehensive for you. We have multiple nav platforms here and um, we share the robot with neurosurgery and we have a schedule for that. So there are days that I'm doing an MIS case and I just use a different nav platform. We have Stealth and we have Brain Lab and um, and, and I'm, I'm comfortable doing that. And I actually do that on purpose sometimes to teach the residents. So for an MIS case for me, like if I showed you a one or a two level fusion, lumbar fusion with MIS screws, it's 100% some navigation platform. Now, on the days that I have the robot, I'll prefer the robot because it's just less radiation. The other nav platform doesn't have the CT merge. And so that for me has been a big a big change in my OR is if I can get a pre-op CT, two fluoro shots is so much faster. The radiology technicians don't have to worry about the OR or the other 3D imaging platform we have. And, you know, you don't have to worry about which tech you have. They just come in, they take the shots, and then the robot's pre-planned and it's, it's go time. Um, so... I, we were careful to adopt, so this is part two, we were careful to adopt uh, and wanted to learn all the nuances about robotics versus regular navigation. And so that 101 case uh, case series, I took out the graphs, but over the course of 18 months, we increased adoption substantially. And now we're kind of at this higher peak percentage, I would say, you know, if it's an open surgery for me, I still freehand. Uh, I haven't found it to be value added for a T10 to pelvis using the robot for every screw. And that's just me. You're going to find other speakers who will say they use it for every case. They use it for open cases, you know, MIS cases, et cetera. So for me, 100% of NAV is used, some NAV platform is used for MIS, S2AI. Uh, and the robot implementation has gone up substantially in the last probably three years. With your system, Brandon, it's cost justification has been the increased use. Is that what you guys have told them? What the cost? What the cost justification? No. So if you really look at the durable or the um, the disposables that go along with navigation or robotics, we're almost the same cost. I haven't put that number out there because uh, I was told that the durables cost at each institution is somewhat protected or proprietary. I'm not trying to like put our numbers out there, but if, if I do a brain lab case and if I do a robotic case, the the incremental um, cost for the surgery is the same, uh, whether it's the drapes, the burr tip or the balls, um, they're almost identical. I think the robot is like $75 more for one different drape. Uh, so we haven't really got in discussion with our institution about cost. They saw their ROI 
from our ability to attract more minimally invasive fusion cases. So the faster, uh, you know, the MIS equals, as we all know, shorter length of stay, quicker time out of the hospital, same DRG, same type of surgery. Um, we didn't really market it. I think there's some places that want to market the heck out of it and say they do robotic surgery. That being said, I do have patients who have told patients and they come to me because they want to have a robot case. I tell them what I just told you guys. It's just a tool and, and it's navigation. And the, the goal here is small incisions and get you out of the hospital with less pain. So we've had conversations about the ROI from this is not from you know, the tool in the OR, it's about the surgeon or about the patient experience and getting them out of the hospital faster. And they're watching that and they're, they're believers in that. Yeah. We're, we're in the middle. Go ahead. Good, Jamie. Yeah. We're in the middle of that discussion. And, and that is the issue is the capital cost and the ROI on the capital cost for our folks. And Bob knows this too. You know, we're deep in that discussion and trying to get them to understand that this now has become something that's good for the hospital to drive efficiency, to drive less complications, you know, better patient experience, you know, makes the operation safer for us as surgeons, less radiation, but also for the patients themselves. So that's an ongoing discussion. So thanks for that clarity. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> Brandon, a quick question. Uh, the great talk. And uh just wanted to see uh, if you use the uh, uh, robotic for just the pediatric idiopathic scoliosis um, I, or, or I not. currently do not I currently okay. do not I I freehand those cases um, uh, maybe I'm a dying breed I've heard of some neurosurgery fellowships and residencies that that like they're 100 percent navigation and, and i think that there might be a parallel there with the brain surgery it's just part of their workflow yeah. uh, i'm not saying everyone is but when i Burton, i learned landmarks i learned open anatomy i i learned the ways to to get into challenging pedicles. Sometimes you miss a pedicle. No, that's okay. You miss a screw. Well, you find other ways to instrument the spine or, or get anchors. And so for me currently, it's not. Okay. There's, a, there's a piece to that, um, Dr. A, that pediatric spines are very mobile. And many times when we're getting landmarks for a scoli case, for example, you do facetectomies. And when you do facetectomy, it becomes more mobile. And that mobility, in my opinion, is very dangerous for any navigation platform if you don't know what you're using. Because theoretically, you'd be attaching the array to a spinous process that's five or six segments away from where you're working. And those segmental changes and those segmental movements, especially after facetectomies, are dangerous. Because all the computer knows, whether it's nav or robotics, is where the spine was in space at the time you got your scan, and there's only one anchor point to the spine. So anything that changed between the time you got your scan and when you're trying to put a screw in that may be only eight inches away, but has five segmental motion segments in between, that's dangerous. So for me, I still rely on my own eyes. I feel, you know, I feel every pedicle, things like that. Thanks. Any other questions? For yeah, hey, Dr. A, I would add one thing to that. We've adopted the 7D flash registration um, and because you do segmental registration, you can move the array up and down the spine and it literally takes seconds. You have an understanding of where that segment is independent of how the spine is moved. So it's uh, continuously updating, you know, the registration. And I think that's a real game changer. I definitely agree with that comment that that 70 has one of the few technologies that in real time without ionizing radiation can update what you're looking at uh, it requ it requires an open procedure but i wh whomever just said that i 100 percent agree that would be the way to be the safest and that's why on that last slide i think the next big step is real-time tracking of our of our vertebra with some other type of sensor or some other type of ultrasound or who knows what uh, because then you get real-time segmental tracking even for mis cases that's the big chasm right there, huh? MIS will be the last to fall. I hope so. Anybody else? Well, again, hey, Brandon, thanks a bunch for being with us.
Good course. to see you. Always sure. a pleasure. Thank Always you, Brandon. Thank Anybody you. can email me if they have any questions or you guys want that slide deck, I'm happy to share. But thanks again, Bob, for the invite. You bet. Have Looking forward day. to see you hopefully next week. Absolutely, Dr. A. Uh, <laughs> I'll hopefully see you. Thanks. Right. Bye-bye.